mean, I knew there would be some kids, but it surprised me how many, how many kids, how many families. It surprised me how much everybody there is just a normal person who could easily be my friend, who could easily be me. I don't know how I'm gonna go back and see our society, the way it is, the, the entitlement and the, 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 the people, the way, the things we moan about, and the things we think we're hard done to over. People are gonna think what they think because they're getting shoved, shoved down their throats every single day. Like, they're coming over to steal your jobs. They're coming over, they're not, they're not, they're not. You're wrong, like, you're wrong. But I understand why you think that, but. I want to give a true representation of what is going on in the island. What is going on in the entire region. What is going on in the world. They've been through so much that you would think that, that everybody would be completely closed down, right? Like at home, it's like everybody's shut down by the pressures of life, by the, by the difficulties of life. Then you see people who have been through um, unbelievable stuff and they're not like that. If, if everyone could come here and see with their eyes, have a personal experience with these people, they would change their entire life. If not their life, the way they look at the world. We've lived here 16 years. Um, there's always been refugees since, uh, I mean, because of the location of the island, it is so close to Turkey, there's always been a, a refugee issue. Europe was uh, falling asleep and had no idea just because the numbers were not uh, really bothering you. I started because I saw somebody being in need. Mm. And I will keep, I will keep doing that no matter, uh, of course. I mean, you shouldn't think if you have any, benefits by saving the life of somebody, and mm. <laughs> you should do it anyway. That's, that's what Europe's supposed to represent. Mm. So this is why I did it. By early 2015, we had boats coming in on the beach, 150 meters from our house. So um, that's how we got involved. It's kind of impossible not to when you're taking your child to school and there's women, children, families on the beach, crying, exhausted, in trouble. Five to 10,000 people were landing on Lesbos' shores every single day. There were days here with 25, 30,000 people, many of them camping out on the streets. Just three, three weeks ago, on the shoreline, we received a boat, and on that boat was an 89-year-old Yazidi woman traveling with her nephew. She, she couldn't walk, she had to be supported. She couldn't speak any other language but, uh, but uh, Arabic. What would force this woman to, first of all, leave her home? Obviously, she's been subject to either war or persecution or, or abuse that, that was intolerable, so she had to move. To pay, all, to give all the savings that she had, everything that she owns, all her worldly possessions to a smuggler to make this journey and arrive in Europe with complete uncertainty about the future, I cannot imagine what would drive that woman to move. Listen, if you see a boat in the, in the middle of, uh, of the sea, yeah. 55 people, uh, children, women, uh, with a stupid engine not really taking them somewhere, or with the engine that broke down, 
then you cannot uh, avoid them. You just throw a rope and you just pull them to, to the safety. And this is uh, what many people did, uh, do, did and do so far. We couldn't understand why the world wasn't here. You know, when it was a couple of boats, okay, you could understand. We both could not avoid the huge number of people that they would keep uh, coming uh, every day and had the need of being supported and uh, yeah. look after and, uh, you know, be helped to, to, to survive, basically, because it was a survival uh, issue. To see them land ashore, oftentimes in deep shock, I've seen people collapse the moment that they're off the boat. I've seen them weep with hysteria. I've seen them showing and exhibiting pure joy and, and love for, for the others on the boat and happiness to see that they're being supported and greeted by people who, who are, are there to, to help them. As the boats went from one every couple of days to one every day to ten every day to the peak was um, over 200 on just the coast here in one day. So it was 12,000 people. Just a few people helping the refugees. We had the majority of the villas saying that by helping the refugees, you're giving the wrong sign, so more refugees are going to come, so the economy is going to be fucked up. Okay. We have to live with it. Mm -hmm. That's my answer. I mean, I cannot just close my doors or I cannot start shooting the people so they don't arrive here. Lesbos is the place where you'd have locals sipping, a, sipping coffee or going about their business and then the next moment going ashore and helping people as they arrive, bringing them dry clothes, giving them water, making sure that they're landing safely. At the same time, you have this extremely overwhelming compassion from all around the world Last summer, as the Greek state was really overwhelmed and couldn't respond to the emergency, you had hundreds of volunteers coming from the United Kingdom, from Sweden, from the Netherlands, from Spain, of Greek nationals coming together and really forming the backbone of this response, whether it was search and rescue at sea with the Coast Guard, whether it was lifeguards on the beach, whether it was medics on the beach, whether it was in the facilities. This was mostly done by volunteers. Uh... We, we come here to try to help in this humanitarian crisis. Uh, 
uh, and our, the, the objective of our ONG is uh, to be here in the castle of Mittelen, um, do a preventive uh, work, uh, watching the sea, uh, waiting to see a, a dinghy uh, on the sea. And if we see it, uh, we have to, to save it in a, a WhatsApp chat uh, to, to ask help because when a dinghy arrives, uh, every help is necessary. What can I do as uh, a human? I mean, what my human feeling is telling me. My human feeling is telling me if you fall down, I will give you my hands to help you to lift up. I know that you're not used to it. In England, for instance, if somebody falls down, you just keep walking. Here we're a bit different. Yeah. We care about each other. But all the stuff that's here was sent by people from around Europe. They, we were never supported by any big NGOs. So we were amazed at the, the European people, oh well, people around the world, who just either sent uh, clothes that they had or they had a collection in their community and sent like piles of diapers, um, baby wipes, kids' clothes. It was amazing. I mean, all of this is just from individuals. It's, it's, you know, it's been depressing to see the world's reaction, but also heartening to see people's reaction and the way people as individuals have been motivated to come and help. I'm not a flower power guy. I just want to help out. I want to teach my daughters, listen. I don't want to teach them anything, I said that wrong. I want to show them that we like care for stuff, you know? When you make trash, pick it up. When you do this, just think about other people. How would they think about it? You wake up two, three in the morning, you're on the shoreline, you receive dozens of boats, then you're in the sites trying to support people, trying to coordinate, then you're with the media trying to explain exactly what happened, and then you're, you're you're constantly chasing the developments. There have been so many. And you see, you see trauma, you see drama, you see death, you see despair, you also see joy, sometimes in a single hour. Um, it's extraordinary. I sleep three hours, eh? <laughs> Each day, during 15 days, so. You have 50, 60 people on the sea with cold. Uh, perhaps uh, they don't know swimming. Uh, the jackets are not good. So it's preventive. Try to get them to a safe place to do the landing and help. Really, we focus on every day is a new day. And one day at a time, one boat at a time, one person at a time. Otherwise, it is really all-consuming. If you start to think of the bigger picture, you could never continue. It's, it's impossible. And I don't think at the beginning we had a clue that we would get so involved. We really thought help would come at some point. We really thought that, oh, these big aid agencies, this is Europe, someone is going to come in and fix this. And they didn't, and it just got worse and worse and worse, and no help came. Well, it did, but in the form of individuals who were just driven to, to come and make a difference. I was on the shoreline with, uh, with our team and with volunteers. It was the 20th of January this year. Freezing cold day, three below zero. Ice cold, razor sharp wind, it was snowing. The seas were really rough and we had 40 boats come in in just the morning. And on any of those boats, you would have families with young children soaking wet, freezing cold, hypothermia cases, and you, you assist them it's very dramatic, and then you have to compose yourself and go to the next boat. Are you going to lock it? Mama? 
Okay, I got to Here, take him. I gotta go get his mom. She just collapsed. Okay. Baby is okay, baby. Baby is okay. Okay, safe. Okay, good. Madam? Okay? Okay. Uh, she's okay? No. That's high. That's high. That's high. That's high. That's high. It's very... Here, let's go over here by the car. Here, more, more, more. Up, up. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Should we? Yalla, I don't have one. I don't have one. Oh. Okay, little by little. Where's the other one? Where we put it? Here? Okay, wait. Okay, wait. We joke in our, in our office with our team that every day on Lesbos is like dog years. It's, it's worth seven days. There's so many things that, that happen in a single day here that, you know, you, could, you lose track of time. People, people really care. The volunteers really care, you know? And I think this thing happens which we have felt here and which people that we know that are volunteering or that we've met that are volunteering, there's this sense that once you're here and once you see it, you can't leave, you can't go back, you can't just go back to your life. And these people, I, I, they're incredible. They, they really struggle to go back to their real lives after they've been here. I mean, you can imagine just leaving the office, going to Greece for two weeks, rescuing several thousand people, seeing people in such despair, in such emotional states, often really happy that they've survived. But then knowing their journey ahead, knowing what they have to go through, knowing what they've left. And these people go back after two weeks to their office and their life that's driven by things that suddenly aren't important anymore. The financial thing, the, the complaint. I mean, we all complain about the milk being off or, you know, something's not right or the weather's really bad. It's all irrelevant. After this, it, it really feels like you're just complaining for nothing. Even though it could entirely flip my life around and make me think that the choices and dreams I had before are based in um, an illusion. You know, they're, they're based in ambition, they're based in monetary gain, self-supporting. You know, now that I've taken, or we've taken this time to actually come out here and fucking do something for other people, really, in your life, it's almost like maybe that's the only real thing that matters. It, the, being around these people has installed just a, a, a deep sense of gratitude for having the people in my life that I love and having them there around me. You know, they're not washed up on some coastline somewhere and I'm never going to be able to hear their voice again. I can go home and speak to these people at the dinner table. And I will, because I get to. And I think that, in some way, that, that's okay. Because that's what I want for these people here. And I don't think, I don't want to feel ashamed that I'm able to do that. Because I don't think they would be ashamed, in, uh, they should be ashamed if it was, you know, if the shoe was on the other foot. This, I saw this as an opportunity to open up our lives again and to really throw out what we are really about. Where in the past many people just judged us that we were like this and ah, they're crazy, they're crazy. And now I have something like, fuck you. So uh, we take this opportunity and, and with all these people together made something really special. So uh, everybody who participated here uh, are big heroes. 
two out of three arrivals are either a woman or a child. The Greek state has been completely overwhelmed, but no one has done more than the locals. The locals still to this day show compassion and generosity, while many others, especially in Europe, have really forgotten what it's like to be a human being. The volunteers are just, it's, they're all in it together. It is solidarity. The volunteers and the, and the people that are staying in the camps, it is solidarity. Solidarity, the compassion, the empathy that this island has shown is equal to, to nothing else in Europe. They just can't stay away, they need to come back. Sometimes they come back now when it's calmer and they feel happier that it's under control and they're not needed. So it's kind of a closure for them. But others, as I said, we've got one volunteer now. She's um, coming out in a couple of weeks. She's gone back to sell her house, give up her job and move here permanently just so she can be part of this. Because it doesn't make sense anymore. Every day that I choose to just go home and carry on living my life as I do in the same way while this stuff is happening. It feels, it feels wrong. If this model here on this island was representative of the whole of Europe, we would have the most tolerant and compassionate society and the European Union would, would really live up to the standards that it's built upon, the values of human rights, of diversity, of tolerance. Many people who came to volunteer came here also because they wanted to see the thing uh, by themselves and many were blown away about the misconception, how you call this, like the, the twisted reality of things. It doesn't mean that there was no drama and whatever, but uh, many people were unaware and at least uh, telling us all the time that whatever they saw on television was here, the reality was totally different. The media has a, a very lopsided view of, of everything in the world. I mean, even now, the protests going on across the world about the governments and things is not mentioned in the media. It's mentioned in social networking and things, but the media doesn't cover thousands of people on the street who are unhappy. The same as the media doesn't really look into these people as people. they just statistics, half a million, a million. What are we gonna do? Let's stop them. Like, it's some kind of plague. They show the fighting to the whole world. They show the worst parts of the human to the whole world. That is not the story that is out there on the island. That is not the story. It's not even like the obvious choice of the story. The media, the media is one big puppet show. Nobody was allowed to take photos here, video or whatever, because we found out that many of the stories were twisted, lied about, uh, uh, yeah, uh, used for self-interest, uh, only making the situation worse, uh, shaping the minds of the hive mind people in Europe uh, more towards the direction they want. And then I had something like, what the hell are you doing here? Like, uh, we came here to help. We never had not even one thing that says that a refugee raped, a refugee steal. A local killed another one. If any fights I've been uh, hearing about yeah. had to do with refugees in the camp, Afghanis, Syrians, yeah. Iraqis, Iranis, or whatever. Here, never. So there's never some like really good intention. No, I never, I never had any. I mean, mm. if something happened, they would pull it up immediately. But nothing. I mean, I cannot blame any refugee personally that he created. A situation which I disliked. Yeah. We've met such incredible people, not just the volunteers, but the refugees. And, and I think, you know, growing up, you don't realize the, the background noise of the news and the TV all the time, that we all have our preconceived ideas about people. Even the most open-minded people, they have this subconscious preconceived ideas. And I've met People from countries that I thought, oh, you know, the press have said this is a dangerous country, these people are at war and everything else. And I've met the most incredible, gentle, educated, open-minded people this year. 
again, the, they say, you know, the, all the women from the Middle East are downtrodden and oppressed. I've met the strongest women from the most bizarre places that are struggling with their kids. They've left the war zone. They're traveling alone all the way across Europe in a boat often with other people's children as well, and the strength of these women is unbelievable. And they painted such a, a one-story kind of view of, of, of what was going on, and it wasn't anything to really do with the families or, or the struggle that was happening here. It was more to do with the political agenda of it. And, and I don't know, groups, large groups of men in their 30s being violent and angry, and, and yeah, I was scared to walk into these places and not, you know, especially with my friends that naturally, all, all I want to do is make sure they're safe and, uh, you know, and okay. And if I'm honest, yeah, I, I had a real, real um, kind of thick uh, anxiety of being put in a situation where I wouldn't know what to do to help everyone. And I was worried that I would be useless. And then coming in and seeing everyone the way they were, it was just, it made me feel like a fucking arsehole because they weren't that, you know, they weren't that at all. If you don't meet a refugee, you cannot understand what this is all about. You know, we can talk about figures until the, the sun sets and numbers mean nothing. I mean, these are huge numbers, 60 million, uh, 1 million coming to Europe in a single year. These are individuals, they're human beings with very deep, dramatic stories. They're extremely brave and courageous individuals. They're normal. They are not threatening. In fact, they're the ones that have left the threat behind. They're the ones that have been targeted every single day. 65 people, bambini, donne, adulti e minorenni. Quindi la situazione bruttissima, i bambini che piangono, non riescono a resistere alla, alla confusione, al casino, alle onde, alla paura. Che cosa? La paura, la paura di morire, la paura di, 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 di non arrivare al sogno che stavo, che sono, con cui sono partito. Invece io sono andato a darle delle mafie e ci hanno fatto fare una strada che non è, non è bellissima. Comunque, in mezzo al mare, e quello che guidava la barca uh, il gommone, quello che guidava il gommone, non era neanche un, un, uno che, che è esperto, non era, nessun, non era esperto, una persona come noi, potevo guidarla anch'io, perché in mezzo alla gente tu guidi, no io non riesco a guidare, guidi te, guidi te, no, poi sale uno e dice vabbè io guido, e aveva un po più, era un po' più sicuro di se stesso. Ma è la mia prima volta di vivere fuori da casa, quindi è un po' difficile. So it's a first impression is the last impression and last forever. So it's a, it's a, I think it's a forever for my life that I feel that dangerous uh, situations and problems. I must uh, see everything to my son good, not bad. Because if I tell you it's bad, he will in my mind all the time this bad, this bad. He cannot uh, learn, he cannot uh, move easy. He will uh, see everything difficult everything uh, not good. I must tell to my, it's very good. We must stay in this one hour to take tea. He learn. All the time he will learn many things and uh, his uh, mind will open and not to close. And uh, when he when will be young boy, I see my son is very good, very good. <laughs> <laughs> Migrants. This has been labeled a migrant crisis. 
And that isn't right. It's, it's incorrect. It's false. This is a refugee crisis. Out of the one million people that arrived in Europe in 2015, 91% of them were coming from one of the top 10 refugee producing countries. Here uh, I could see that it's very easy to be happy together. <laughs> Many different people with different languages, you don't understand, but everybody likes to laugh, to dance, to sing. We need love, we need basic things, and we need the help of the others for all, for the salud, para, la, eh, para los cuidados, to the, eh, look forward. So. What the hopes we have? So in this way, I think uh, when you you guys listen our hopes and you spread information all over the world, so one day and uh, and the I, the time is coming. So the completion of the our hopes due to you guys. Baby, baby. Take it that way, that way. Baby, baby. Baby, baby. Okay, okay. He's pretty dry. Sorry. They just... <laughs> okay. It's, it's hard when you've um, come from where we're from. And we have no idea what courage really is. And these guys, man. These little babies. Just open your fucking eyes. Be what you say. What you that you that you want. Be what you say that you want to be. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Let's let's start from somewhere. Let's say that we all agree that we are humans. We all agree that we want to stop the fucking war. These people are dying. They want to live. That's it. Flat out. They want a life. And we we are. I feel like our society blames them for that. And it. It fucking enrages me. Now that I see it, I, I don't, it's not anger and it's not humiliation and it's not shame, it's a mixture. And there's no other reaction that comes from me apart from getting upset because I don't know how to, rea to react. The, what's called the refugee crisis, I think, should really be regarded as a 
moral crisis in the West. The political willingness is often not there to respond until government leaders can start to make a case to their own people that it's important for domestic political purposes. Now, I'm not saying whether that's good or bad, that's just the reality of the way the world works. All you've done by telling me, by, by, by setting up this diagnosis, is, is, is created a sense of despair in me. I think maybe that sense of despair is an important first step to see the depth of the problem, a kind of pessimism of the intellect, a willingness to sort of, an ability to really struggle uh, to, uh, to, 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 to not put our hand, head in the sand, not try to think that we to try to live in a bubble, effectively live in a, the fortress, a bubble of consumer luxury and even opulence. Refugee crisis today, actually it's easily manageable if there was uh, humane attitudes, but it may not be pretty soon. Uh, if uh, rising sea levels are predicted to cause uh, tens of millions of people to flee low-lying regions like Bangladesh, which will be an uh, indescribable uh, uh, calamity. If we're scared of refugees, what are we going to do with climate migrants? Okay, 10,000 Tuvaluans, 12,000 Tokelauans. Okay, we can probably handle that. But what do you do about one-third of Bangladesh? You know, 50, 60 million visas for Bangladeshis. So the general picture that we see around the world is there are countries that generate refugees, like the United States, Britain, others. There are countries that absorb refugees, like Lebanon, Jordan, Turkey. These places, all of the debate, just to show how irrational the debate is about building a fortress, making it difficult for them to come in, what it does is, is exacerbates uh, the problems that poorer countries out in the near neighborhood are going to have in dealing with, right now, 85% of the world's refugees are in, are in so-called developing countries. Where they enter Europe um, partly depends on the routes that are open to them at the time and where smugglers will take them. They're there are many women and children coming in as well. There's a lot of talk in the media about it being dominated by young men, and that's, that's not borne out by the figures that are published um, internationally. Turkey has over two million refugees. Uh, it's estimated that about 90% of them are women and children. There's a lot of preconceptions about what a refugee is and, and why they are here. If you go back to the night, I grew up in, in Southern California in the 1980s, right? Rambo. The Ram, there's one Rambo movie where he's out there with these, uh, with these jihadis who are fighting against the Soviets. So it's reflected in the, in the popular culture and had to make a shift. And it already uh, easily could make those shifts to those, you know, those bad shifty Arabs. Uh, uh, but nevertheless, you saw uh, it's bad shifty Arabs because in the United States as well, you know, Afghani, uh, uh, Iraqi, Irani, uh, Iranian, none of these sorts of things. It's all just some sort of, again, it's a, it's a comic book consciousness and sort of uh, uh, with a long history, you know, stereotypes. Uh, do they have a genetic predisposition to criminality? Obviously not. On a, at a moral level, why are these people refugees to begin with? And you think it's not a question of, of, of charity. It's a question of justice. It's a question of justice. But the, the, the mainstream political debate is so far away from being honest about our own, we as Western citizens, our own role in this ongoing human tragedy. Again, uh, uh, would be comical if it weren't so tragic in its human, uh, in its human dimension, that they become, they get victim, they, they get demonized as ISIS when a lot of these people are fleeing from ISIS. So, yeah. You know, some of that narrative is being led by government. So, the, the media, in some ways, are, are reporting a, a narrative that's there. Um, being created by politicians who are trying to shape a policy agenda about who deserves protection and, and the help of governments. Yeah, actually here is people saying they pinch our jobs. Why do they say they pinch our jobs? Because they read in some rubbishy newspaper they pinch our jobs. Whereas every economic study shows 
that if you let refugees into your economy and allow them access to the workforce, they create at least 1.1 job for every refugee. In other words, for every 10 refugees that come into your economy, there are 11 new jobs. So they're not pinching your jobs, they're actually creating your jobs. If you are worried about losing your job because someone who doesn't speak this language well, who doesn't have an economic, sorry, doesn't have an education that's recognised in this economy, is going to steal your job, then you don't bloody well deserve one. Meanwhile, most citizens are distracted, involved in whatever the consumer kind of consciousness that they're in, and it's that era, that kind of depoliticized uh, a citizenry that is susceptible to the kinds of demagogic manipulation. Uh, I think uh, there are political parties that are trying to persuade voters to take an anti-immigration stance. The EU-Turkey agreement is um, predicated on a fundamental violation of international law, as many have pointed out, which is that a basic tenet of international law is that anyone can leave any country that they want to. And yet the EU-Turkey agreement was based on the notion that Turkey would stop Syrian refugees leaving um, and prevent them from embarking uh, in order to shield the, the EU from, you know, the, the influx of, of large numbers of refugees. That is, is, is a, just a, a monumental violation of basic international law that is very familiar to anybody in this field, including to members of the EU governments that uh, agreed to that treaty. The rich countries react in a striking way. Keep them away from us. So Europe is bribing and pressuring Turkey to keep refugees away from its border. The U.S. is doing the same with Mexico. We, we, we created the conditions for which they're fleeing. You keep them away from our border. If they happen to get here, we'll deport them or something like that. You know, they don't just stop the boat and pick the people up. They'll sink it and leave the people in the water and then come back, pick them up later. Have a little fun by going around the boats with their smaller boat and creating a wake so they're actually filling boatfuls of women and children with water. They've got water cannons on the bigger boats. Ah, it's, it's horrible. The European response, insofar as it has been a response to the refugee crisis, uh, really tells us that the European Union is broken as an institution that's capable of dealing with this. It can't even implement its own policy. It has a policy, which is a quota policy, is to distribute refugees uh, around Europe according to the wealth and population size of the countries. It's utterly failed even to do that. So in response uh, to this, in the response to the failure of its own policy, it's simply got a push them out to sea policy. That's what they're doing with the, with the, with the refugees. It makes a mockery of the argument that Europe is about uh, the free movement of people. It's about the free movement of people if you're born here. When you look at the political realities there's no point making a value judgment about whether the politics is good or politics is bad. Politics just is. Mm. And you need to understand its dynamics so you can use those. Now, if you don't have resources, you can't do anything. If you do have resources, you can. And that can be really, really frustrating. You can sit there and literally watch people die that you could have kept alive if the right resources came in. But if you don't have the resources, there's nothing you can do. The way people are treated has an effect on the way they behave. How are these people going to think about Europe 20 years from now? When you've got nothing to lose but your chains, you're very susceptible to also, you know, also not only those sorts of people can become uh, 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 radicalized in a kind of nihilistic direction, but certainly those kinds of objective grievances that have been created and continue to be created, not only through uh, direct military aggression, but also through, uh, you know, propping up the, dic the dictators that are our friends. Uh, so, uh, 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 so creating a, an environment where either tyranny or chaos are the only alternatives is the, precisely the kind of environment where you're going to get all kinds of uh, extremist ideologies able to take root. Take a look at the uh, uh, recent terrorist um, actions in France and Belgium, like Nice, for example. Who carried them out? Not recent immigrants, uh, people who had lived there. So in France, for example, uh, I think maybe 60 or 70% 70, 70 of people incarcerated are North Africans. The uh, degraded, humiliated, depressed communities in Europe of immigrants uh, who uh, can become 
uh, among young people can become attracted by jihadism when there's nothing else in their lives to deal with that. You want to deal with terrorism, deal with its sources. Have you realized I'm not a, a Muslim? <laughs> he was like, I said, come on, man. Fuck Jesus, fuck Allah. The moment I said, fuck Jesus, fuck Allah, mm -hmm. you should see his face. He didn't know how to react. I saw the anger in his face because I said, fuck Allah. Mm. And I said, come on, man. Did you ask the guy who gave you the hand to pull you out of the water where he believes? He said, no. I said, so you see, this is not time for a religious, this is time for people. Mm -hmm. Can you deal with it? Can you forget your anger about the Westerns or the Christians or whatever and just see the human now? We still talk, Sahel. Mm. It's okay. I mean, this guy understood. <laughs> But if we spend time with them, I think the other ones will understand too. Yes. So we are not have to be afraid about the revenge from a jihad or whatever. Anybody created what we saw the last days in televisions about Paris and... Yeah. They were uh, citizens of Belgium and citizens of Paris. Maybe people like in uh, Elephant and Castle area this year, <laughs> mm -hmm. yes? Of course, if they put you in elephant and castle, you're becoming a ghetto. And yes, you will fuck the English Malacca, who, you know, is getting your nerves sometimes. So it's our behavior that creates what creates. That's my feeling. Mm. And these times are the times for us to win the future jihads, jihadists. If we treat them the way they, we should, or we know, then we can win them. If we treat them the way we treat them, like in the domain now, I will give them all the rights of the world to the kid which is 10 now, in 10, 15 years, to put a bomb around his body and go and explore, I don't know where. Mm. Because the memories he gets from us now, will follow, from our behavior, eh, will follow him the next uh, years of his life. Sometimes you say, I would like to be another animal, not a human. <laughs> what animal would you be? A dolphin. <laughs> Today. <laughs> Today a dolphin. Tomorrow a cat. <laughs> and sleep, can sleep with the sun. <laughs> <laughs> and at night I go to look for a pretty cat. <laughs> if I, I'll be another animal, I'll be more human. <laughs> I just the first thing, kids coming up to you, wanting to get on your shoulders and play with you and pulling funny faces at the kid and doing tiger impressions and the parents laughing and understanding the situation that they were in. They were finding, they, they were like literally the essence of hope. They were finding, they were finding strength where most of us, from what we see, is like there can't be any. These people were, you know, normal middle-class people with, with careers and families and homes and 
and that's all that's all they want you know they're not asking for a lot they just want a place to go and a job so they can provide for the kids and and build some kind of future for the kids that's all they want it was like I was being I was touched and that was a really profound moment there's loads man there's loads every day that we're out here. Every every hour we go out into the jungle, not the Cowley jungle, but like the metaphorical jungle. Um, something surprising, you know, something you couldn't anticipate, something beautiful, something meaningful. I mean, the complexity of life, something with all the brightness and the power and the light of the sun mixed with all the fire and the destruction of the sun. to be poetic. We had the part of a tent, which looks like a magic wand. So we're playing with the tent, we're bumping fists with everybody, we're pretending to be horses, we're dancing. Obviously, there was a language barrier, but it didn't mean anything, man. You trot and be a horse and you got a wand. You know, you're a knight, you know. Uh, I, I, never, I never smiled so much. I've never had such a fucking good time with kids. Or oh, people, you know, it was just so, there was no barriers, like, you walk up to some kid in London and you're like, hey, can I get on your shoulders? They tell you to go fuck yourself and probably stab you or something. You know, at least there's that level. But this was like, hello, my friend. And it wasn't like you were being patronizing. It was like, no, we are, we are friends because there was no barriers. Color didn't mean anything. Religion didn't mean anything. The fact that we were there and we were just weren't like open to them was, was all they needed. I kind of like knelt down and uh... This little, little girl, like, grabbed both of my hands really tight. <laughs> and she just, she wouldn't let go. She wouldn't let go of my hands. And I sat with them for ages. She was just looking at me so intensely, you know. It was a real kind of, it was a real moment. And I really quickly realized that, that any of my shit about like what I'm supposed to do or how I'm supposed to behave or whether I'm in the right place or, or whether I'm being, how I'm supposed to be being, just kind of like went away. And, um, and I looked at her and she was just so small, you know, she was just so small and her face was all scabby, like, and she just had so much openness and, and happiness and love and excitement in her eyes, but also this kind of like, real intense like need and they're just trying to um, be happy in each moment to, um, that, that was is probably the most beautiful thing I've ever seen ever there's nothing that compares state of being that presence that acceptance of Hell, looking fire in the face and moving through. That was profound and beautiful and will resonate with me for a long time. Now in this moment, I do not know the effect that will have on me now. I was hopeful because I thought, well, I was a refugee when I got to the UK. We were put in detention centers or camps, we were given a house and, you know, then we just sort of got on with our lives. There wasn't all this in the middle. And I had so much faith in like, for example, if I watched the TV and something was going on, I thought, oh, oh, the UN is there. Oh, great, the UN is there. I feel so much better. Or the Red Cross. These names that you hear and you sort of trust and think they yeah. are really like do amazing work. But being here, I'm actually, I'm disappointed in everything. And I don't believe in, I'm just, I'm the West and everything that we think we do when we're civilized and where it's just everything's broken. They invite you for dinner and for lunch and for breakfast and for tea and for coffee and you're always eating actually and <laughs> having yeah. yeah and you're having I don't know just interesting and also fun talks so it's not only about um, the suffering and like the waiting and the hopeless situations which are always shown in the media it's it's also about getting friends and um, yeah just building great. Relationships. relationships, yeah. Mostly via Google Translate. Yeah. It's not very useful. Oh, well, yeah, and with this and... <laughs> yes, good. And we improved our Arabic, yes, so... Yes, you did yeah. really good, actually. You it, learned, learned yeah, Arabic. it's... Yeah. No, of course, and especially with the children, it's, it's so easy to get in contact.
Yeah. It actually realize the language isn't really... Yeah, it doesn't matter actually. It's not a huge problem. And it's also about like, then they invite you for, oh, sleep in my tent, it doesn't matter, so my home is your home and feel free to come whenever you want to come. So it's like, um, yeah, actually it was my home. In a weird way, but it was. And um, we were visiting our families, and this guy came over and he was like, "My friend, please, please." And I, and I sort of followed him, and he took me to this to this tent, and there was a white tent, and on the floor was um, cardboard that had been opened out with UNHCR logos, <laughs> and there was a woman, heavily pregnant. I say about nine. She, we found out she yeah, was like nine months, months. Pregnant, huge, really swollen face, really uncomfortable, and she just sat there, not even a blanket. And then the husband, I got one of our friends to translate said that he'd asked the military for blankets and they said they'd run out. So I said, right, I'll be back tomorrow. We took a whole lot of stuff. So what we had to do was park round the back and there was this sort of like a wire. And did you guys break the wire? Because I was after you. Or was the wire slightly damaged? Sure, sure. <laughs> okay. okay. Basically there was, there was an entrance and we got in, we smuggled in the bed, the stuff. And um, I mean, it, I filmed it actually. I posted yeah. it on Facebook because I think, <laughs> Who would believe me that there was a pregnant woman who had nothing and I had to smuggle things in like a drug dealer? And actually, the night that we got tear gassed, I started about 7 o'clock, didn't I, the tear gassing, and it was in Area A, which is quite a way away from where we were, but you could obviously could hear that you could, could hear the tear gas. Yeah, and you could it, see it. You could see the tension, and, and people would come around and say, volunteers have to leave now, volunteers have to leave, but we didn't leave, we stayed, because lots of families came into yeah, the culture centre. And they lost their children. Yeah, a lot of them. lots of people came into the culture centre because they were running away from the gas. So Didak, who um, runs the culture centre, had got, got, got out his guitar, we put some lights on. Yeah, yeah. I was preparing my class for the next day, so I was cutting out animals. <laughs> just like, I'm just so it bizarre. It was a weird situation. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it was really weird. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. And then all of a sudden, one, I don't know, pellets or whatever, came somewhere near the school. And before I had a chance to stand up, and, and at this point, the culture centre was bursting with families, people, there were people everywhere. We had a light on, so it was sort of everywhere everyone was coming. Then the gas came to the school, so... So yeah, they um, too got the school for And some then days. it was just, all of a sudden you can't breathe, you're choking, you, yeah, you can't collapsing. see, yeah. we're screaming for people to leave. We were kind of prepared. I mean, when we think about that, we have to prepare ourselves for a tear gas attack in yeah, Greece. Yeah, in a school. In a school, in a refugee camp. <laughs> yeah. That yeah, just sort of sets everything. And you have pleasure in excess Don't worry, it will all end soon The crack of doom is coming soon And so your future's looking bright And you've reached the giddy heights Don't worry, it will soon end It is all shallow and pretend the cracker doom is coming soon the cracker doom is coming soon ha! Ha! Shh. <laughs>
I feel like those, the suffering of those people is not, uh, is not an acceptable price to pay for my personal freedom or my personal self-realization or whatever I'm gaining from it. But I'm also incredibly glad that I am gaining that from it. They've got nothing and they're grateful for it because it's better than the chaos that they were in days before or weeks before. I feel ashamed. You know, I know I'm not dropping bombs on Syria. I know that I'm not making these political decisions, but I know that I'm not doing much else to, to, to change the situation apart from what I've been doing here with you guys. And I've been proud of this more than anything I've ever done in my life. But I think for us all, when we go home and sit on the couch, like uh, when everything's over, because I think we all need to do that to take a rest. Uh, six months every day, seven days a week, uh, from the morning till the evening, uh, it does something with your system. And I think when we get home all and have that rest that we all will collapse and cry and whatever. Any thinking person has a responsibility to carefully look at the evidence and sift out, you know, what it is legitimate to fear and what it's legitimate to be concerned about and to address from what it is really illegitimate and irresponsible to demonize. We all, every human, separates themselves from things that are a little bit painful and they exclude themselves from that. Um, it's not part of me, it's not my fault. I've got to look after number one. <sighs> Other people will deal with that. I don't want to deal with that. There's so much separation. We need to take time out of our obsessed, self-obsessed, horseshit, you know, capitalist existences <sighs> just, just to give time for other people. Fine, we don't have any money. We don't have any way of, of helping these people outside of just being there for them and smiling with them and making them understand that there are people out that actually give a shit about their plight. And I think if I, I've seen on this island that, that it has been very powerful, that, that people do need that solidarity. You know, I don't even think, you know, my brother lives in LA, he's 21 years old. He didn't know what the word solidarity was. Never heard it before I told him a couple of months ago. You know, that is, the, is, is what happens to people when they obsess over our media. To be devoid of the knowledge of solidarity. You get up in the morning, um, there's self-evidently a lot wrong with the society around you. You can choose to do something about it or you can choose to lie on the settee. I choose to do something about it. Um, I think the way you sustain yourself over time is you have to have both the impatience to want to change things now and a historical view about how change comes about. The impact of what you do may take a long time to play out. It's waiting to be told what, like, they don't know, nobody knows. And all the time that we just talk or, or push it to one side because it's not convenient, they're still there waiting for a fucking answer from the world. And all the answer has to be is, let's just figure this out. The same way that if your granny was standing on your doorstep in the freezing cold with a fucking respiratory problem or a bullet wound, <laughs> you would say, Come inside, sit down, let me get you a doctor and a cup of tea. I'm never going to go back to the ungrateful person that I was. In the midway of this, our mortal life. I found us in a gloomy wood astray. Gone from the path direct. How savage wild that forest. 
how robust and rough it's grown. It's to remember only our dismay with news in bitterness not far from death. My sense is down on the true path I left. Spirits of tormented that invoke a second death that dwell content in fire for that they hope to come into whose regions of thou with desire God who oh, thou didst not adore I do beseech thee to lead me that I St. Peter's gate may view through me I pass into the city of war through me I pass into eternal pain through me amongst the people lost for I just as the founder of my fabric moved before me things create were none Save things, no eternal and eternal I endure. All hope. Abandon you and me. <laughs>